One of the most important uh, things for people to get out of these videos is in fact the relationship between interest professional activities, competencies, and milestones. And they are in fact intricately connected. So we can start with the EPAs because that's really what we're talking about. And even in the definition, if you remember, criteria for an EPA was the integration of competencies. It requires the integration of competencies, most commonly across domains. So basically, and if you look at the figure, each EPA can be mapped to one, or two, three, or four domains of competence. And those domains uh, will vary depending on what the activity is. Now, I want to say from the outset, you could probably map or find a com uh, compelling argument to map almost every competency to every EPA. But what you really want to get to is what are the critical competencies? What are the ones where in their absence, there's no way any faculty is going to trust a learner to do them without direct supervision or indirect supervision? So the first thing is, what are the major domains of competence? And then within those domains, you should choose the one or two or three critical competencies that require integration for that EPA. So you have an EPA, it has several, it maps to several domains of competence, one, two, three, and then within those domains to two or three competencies. Now remember, the competencies each have their milestones. Those are behavioral descriptors across the developmental continuum of performance on that competency. So each of those competencies has a level one or the lowest level of performance, a level two, a level three, a level four, and a level five. Now here's what gets really fun. You can take each of those levels and you can put together a picture of a learner at that level. So if I take the milestones, which are behaviors, for each of the critical competencies in an EPA from the same level, level one, I'm going to see what a learner looks like who's a novice. If I take all of the level two milestones and put them together in a composite, I'm going to see what a learner looks like who is an advanced beginner. All the way up to the fifth milestone where if I put those together, I get a composite of what an expert learner looks like. I actually think in this way, the milestones advance our discussion and our ability to assess EPAs beyond even the original thought process in the Netherlands, which is where they came from. So now what we can end up with is an EPA that we've agreed within our professions, within psychiatry, within pediatrics, are, is an essential work task of that profession. We can then say, this is what it looks like to perform as a novice, an advanced beginner, competent, proficient, or expert. And we can share that mental model. It's moving from the old-fashioned, I know it when I see it, which we know actually doesn't bear out in the literature, to a new-fashioned, I know what I'm looking for, and I know what I see. I'll know it when I see it. And even better, I know what I'm looking for, and it's the same thing my colleagues are looking for when they go into the room, and all of us will know it when we see it. So what's exciting to me about the concept of EPAs is that, number one, they bring trust and supervision into the assessment equation, something that you and I and everybody, one of our colleagues, are doing implicitly all the time anyway. Number two, they make sense to faculty. They are actually what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and it embeds assessment in the clinical work environment. And number three, it allows a common mental model through connection to the milestones so that each of us can walk in and look for the same thing and have a little bit more uh, reliability around our assessment of these EPAs. So for me, that's why I'm invested in EPAs.